The next item of business is a debate without motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on shaping parliamentary procedures and practices for the future. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Martin Whitfield to open the debate on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Mr Whitfield, up to eight minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, um, it is a, a true pleasure to see you in your seat today for this, um, the first of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee debates. And we chose um, to debate on this, in essence, ourselves here in this building. Because, as Donald Dewar put it um, at the opening of this building, albeit in a different place, wisdom, justice, compassion, integrity, timeless values, honourable aspirations for this new form of democracy, born as it was at the cusp of a new century. Donald Dewar went on, I look forward to the days ahead when this chamber will sound with debate, argument and passion when men and women from all over Scotland will meet to work together for a future built from the very first principles of social justice, equity, access, participation and rights. And I know that I am joined today by all of the members of the committee um, to offer their contributions. But the purpose of this, at the outset, at the start of the sixth session, perhaps its terrible teenage years of this parliament, where we can talk about things that our parents would gasp at, where we can suggest ideas that others may just laugh at, but to allow us within this environment to consider how we go forward to reach a maturity so that we can respect and represent the people of Scotland. A time to look at the rules and the conventions, the procedures and practices, some that have crept up on us and some that have been thrust on us by circumstances out with our control. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank those at SPICE for producing a very helpful report on the changes that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced on this parliament and the way those that operate and decide on the procedures within here took the opportunity to make sure we stayed open, we stayed relevant, we could hold the government to account and we could represent the people of Scotland. So here we find ourselves in this, the great debating chamber, the centrepiece of the architectural parliament that sits here, but also the room that I think best sums up the intentions of this parliament, not to scream and shout across a brick, not to say we have to be two sword lengths apart, not to say we have to be so far back the shoe won't hit the speaker at the front. We are here so that we can see each other, so that we can hold a debate where we can agree, where we can disagree, where we can put to point ideas to hold other ideas to account. But is this a controlled arena, much like those who are old enough can remember the 1970s wrestling television programmes where the end was known before it started? Or are we a bear pit where we just tear to sunder anyone else's ideas? Or are we a debating chamber? Is this a venue to inquire of ideas, to push people further in their thinking, perhaps to make them reconsider whether they're in a cul-de-sac? Because it is in this venue that the answers that the people of Scotland are looking for it to come. I wonder if my friend might give way. More than welcome to. Daniel Johnson. I, I'm very grateful to the convener for giving way. And, I, and I'm doing this because I know he was uh, in, encouraging uh, interventions while he was uh, speaking. I think this is the first debate I can remember uh, where we are actually considering how we do our business in this place. And I'm very appreciative that the committee has brought this forward. So I'm wondering whether this is the intention of the committee to continue with this and perhaps return to the chamber at future dates so we can contemplate how we develop uh, on an ongoing basis, not a one-off basis. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for the intervention and indeed it allows me to offer the opportunity in the new year at the opening of the evidence session for the committee for all across this chamber to contribute their ideas and thoughts. And this is the, the little seedling that will start with that so that items, ideas, pros and cons can go onto the record so that we can consider them in the evidence that's going forward. 
And indeed, for those out with this chamber, there will be an opportunity for people across Scotland to, to contribute their ideas. So what is it that we want to look at? Well, we want to look at debate. But I'm going to put that to one side, having exercised my mind on various thoughts about it, but I am indeed more desperate to hear others' ideas before sharing my own. The functionality of blue jeans and teams, I, I raise this today with some trepidation after events of yesterday, but it goes to the heart of whether or not, as a political community, we see the value in hybrid um, hearings, both at committee level and in chamber. Does it make us more family friendly? Does it allow a wider draw of people who may be interested in contributing within these walls? But what are the implications for that as individuals and as individual parliamentarians? Be it your work pattern, your workload, travel practices, constituency work, and I raise this because it is important, your family life. Stephen Kerr. Grateful to the convener for giving way. He alluded to um, tea time wrestling on World of Sport earlier and uh, likened our proceedings to kind of a pre-baked formula. But hasn't the hybrid arrangement, particularly in this chamber, hasn't that just kind of cemented that feeling that we've got that is a little bit sterile sometimes, there's not enough engagement? What does my uh, friend think? Martin Whitfield. An excellent intervention, uh, and I thank Stephen Kerr for it. And I am going to take the um, lawyer's approach, which still hives at the back of my brain, and say, let us listen to others before I throw in my conjecture. But certainly the existence, the existence and the need for IT puts a different perspective on the control that needs to happen for events to work through in their time. More than welcome to. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. And on this point of kind of hybrid, uh, would you accept, which is my feeling, that uh, the norm should be to be in the chamber but there should be exceptions for, for different reasons, one being constituencies which are much further away. Martin Whitfield. Can I very much thank John Mason for that intervention? And indeed, I will uh, approach with the same loyally philosophy of thank you. I will listen and comment later on it, because you do raise a very important point about what the expectation the people of Scotland have on their MSPs. What is it to be an MSP? What are the responsibilities that go with that? and where should they be crafted and tried out? In this chamber, or if by necessity, particularly given the very diverse nature, space, and travel arrangements within Scotland, that sometimes it's impossible for people to make it into this chamber. Which brings another thing which I have been cornered at by a number of people, and I wish just simply to put on the record as a question. Should there be criteria developed in relation to circumstances under which government ministers should participate virtually in the parliamentary proceedings, be it chamber or committee, or whether they should indeed be here within the chamber or in front of the committee. And the final area that I put merely as a question, not to close down any other offerings, is the question of proxy voting. Voting for members who are ill or on parental leave or maternal leave. Should they still have the right to exercise their vote through a colleague because they still represent their constituents, but they are at a time where I think it is fair to say possibly the debating style and the statutory instruments that come before this committee may not be at their forefront of their mind. Why should their constituents lose out on the opportunity through their representative for a vote to appear? And at that point, I intend to sit and encourage contributions from as many people as possible. This is the start of the evidence session, but will help enormously. I very much look forward to the contributions that are to come. And if I can just finish once again with Donald Dewar, when the men and women from all over Scotland will meet to work together for a future built from the first principles of social justice. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call on George Adam, a generous seven minutes minister. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Mr Whitfield for an excellent speech and opening to this debate? Because it is an extremely important debate we're having today. I will say that I didn't get his wrestling reference from the 1970s being too young. Uh, because I, I don't know that it was on just before the football results uh, in any shape or form. But I welcome the committee uh, bringing forward this debate. Because we all have to admit the last 
20 months here where the COVID pandemic has brought many challenges to us, and including how this Parliament functions and on its day-to-day -day basis. But the function it must, and as the Parliament, we must continue to be flexible. And as we deal with these many challenges we currently face, it's no exaggeration to say that it's essential for the delivery of democracy in Scotland that this Parliament has been able to continue to meet and hold government to account over the past 20 months. But this has not been a simple process. Over the past 20 months, we've had all, we've had all kinds of uh, problems in understanding the new ways of working. Government has had to deal with that. MSPs have had to deal with that. Parliamentary authorities have had to deal with that, adapt and change to the ever-changing situation we've found ourselves in. And as I said, that this has been a strange time for us all. For me, even more so, because I love people, presiding officer. I love when this place is full of people and there's events and we're moving forward. You see, you truly do see the best of this place when this is a full functioning parliament. But we've had to deal with the challenges that have been in front of us, which is we have had to make sure that many of us have had to be either hybrid, working from home, or some of us here. And it's been a difficult time for us. So I've seen these changes happen. I've had a front row seat on the Parliamentary Bureau, first as an observer, as the SNP Chief Whip, and now as the Minister for Parliamentary Business. And this hasn't been easy. And we've had problems along the way. But, presiding officer, can I put on record my gratitude to all the members of the parliamentary staff who have managed to get us to a position where we do have an option of the hybrid technology? Because I know for a fact that during these many meetings that we had in the early days, there was this came from a standing start. There was no technology for us to be able to use and to push that forward. So can I thank all the members of the parliamentary staff who have been able to make sure that we, as a parliament, have been able to continue. They have kept Scotland's democracy functioning by creating a virtual parliament from nothing. The, the chamber, the committee, and eventually, uh, basically, we were able to do it hybrid. There have been many teething issues along the way, and I'll admit, presiding officer, there's been times when eventually I've become extremely frustrated by it all. But who hasn't at one point? Yes? Daniel Johnson. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving me, and I, I agree with him. It is remarkable what we've managed to do in a short space of time. But I, I think it would be a mistake if we approached this debate assuming that everything was perfect prior to the pandemic. It was merely a, a question of adapting. I mean, does he not think that there's a question here for how we use the chamber both prior to the pandemic and going forward? And critically, is there a question for the government about how it uses the chamber? I, I would question whether or not the government uses the chamber to think out loud enough, uh, you know, essentially using its time to congratulate itself a bit too much rather than actually thinking about the big topics of the day. Is that, is that not something the government needs to think about? I think when you actually look, when you actually look Mr uh, Johnson brings up uh, va some valid points that I agree with, where when you look at the actual process that we've had to deal with and work through over the past while, there are many new ways we can find to work. There's many different ways that this place can work. We can adapt and change to some of the ideas that we've had here. But the whole point of this debate, I believe, presiding officer, is for us to just step back, take a deep breath and think about how we, as a parliament, decide we move forward in all this. Because as when we go back on to the... the, the, the in, as been online for most of the time, there's been many teething issues along the way. And uh, I've said that already, but see some of the times like yesterday when things have happened, they've been a mi minority of the time. Most of the time when things have happened, it has been the members' actual own broadband that has been the issue at fault. And I have to admit that myself, because it's happened to me on many occasions. Mr Kerr. Stephen Kerr. Indeed, I recall some difficulties of late with the Minister's uh, home broadband. But I'm not sure he gave Daniel Johnson a definite answer to the question he asked. Does the Minister accept that prior to the emergency nature of the meetings of Parliament over the last 20 months, that there were procedural issues about the business conducted in this chamber and elsewhere in this Parliament that could be improved or reformed? Minister. I think I said to Mr Johnson as well was the fact that we can take this opportunity to look and move forward. There have been many new ways of working and many new ideas that have come up. And we have moved forward with this uh, and to make sure that we have this debate and we move forward. I recognise, for one, recognise the value of today's debate and reflecting the changes that we've had to make on how the Parliament has adapted during the pandemic. 
and what issues we have had to learn during that. But I find that in the time of difficulty, it's good to keep a clear, positive attitude. I like to just, I've always got a glass full type of attitude when it comes to debates like this, because I think that during these tests and times, we have to be positive and look at what has worked and what we, how we can make things better as well. But it's extremely important that the Parliament looks at what we can continue to achieve with the technology. I've got a couple of points to make at the moment. I appreciate that not everyone is a fan of virtual or hybrid proceedings, and we can all acknowledge that the debates and statements have a different character under the circumstances, but they offer a clear advantage than the fact that they have kept us all safe for the past 20 months. We have worked with... Yes, I will. Gillian, I'll, I'll take Gillian. Gillian Mackay. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. I apologise to Mr Mason. Um, does the Minister agree with me that actually we need to keep this hybrid system? It's been hugely important for those of us within the Chamber who have a disability and potentially for those who could have a long-term health condition in the future. And that we congratulated ourselves on electing a diverse parliament this time round and that attracting new people who actually need to keep that hybrid way of working. And before the Minister responds, I appreciate that we're discussing ways of working, but we do use surnames to Minister. Minister. I apologise for that, presiding officer. I think it's the first time in 11 years I've actually made that mistake. Uh, but uh, yes, I do agree with the member that it does give us, hybrid does give us the opportunity for those that have a different type of lifestyle. You could have an example. If I use my own wife as an example with multiple sclerosis, someone with multiple sclerosis who could be great one day in the chamber and the next day uh, wouldn't be able to come to work, then the hybrid system would clearly make that more accessible to them. So there is something for us all to look at this. But as we look to the future, which I admit seems difficult with some of the... Uh, <laughs> yes, OK, then I will do. John Mason. Hey, I, I thank you for his generosity. I thank him. Uh, one, one of the things about hybrid which I find difficult is that uh, we cannot intervene. It, those of us in the chamber cannot intervene on people uh, on screen and the people remotely cannot intervene on us. And that's clearly the case right now. Um, I, I would just hope there's some way around that because I feel that's a big disadvantage. I wonder if he agrees. Minister. This is something that the parliamentary authorities and we all need to look at, is how we have often brought it up at Bureau, how we can find a way to make that technology more interact with those in the chamber as well when we're hybrid. So I do agree it's something we need to find a solution for. But as we've looked forward, and I hope I managed to get a few lines in, President Officer, before we end up with another intervention, uh, but the benefits of working uh, can, uh, can be seen for one of carbon footprint. The fact that many of us have stayed at home and those that live in other parts of the country, there's been a way that we can use this technology to help with other ideals as well. And I think that's something we have to look at as well. With regards to technology and those that have difficulty with working from home or they can't come into Parliament on a regular basis, it gives the option of a parliamentary uh, uh, future for someone putting their names forward for that as well. So, on the whole, presiding officer, can I say that at the end of the day, we have had a very difficult 20 months. Uh, we have had to find new and important ways of working. And I think the Parliament has done that in many cases. I think as we move forward, there are many other ways we can do this. But let's, let's, not remember, let's not forget the fact that why we have done this is because we have tried to find a way to make, keep us safe, the parliamentary staff safe, our own staff safe, while still serve the people of Scotland. Thank you. And I will call on Stephen Kerr, a generous six minutes, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome uh, this debate. It is an enormous privilege to be a member of the Scottish, privilege, uh, Scottish Parliament. And we've all been sent here to do a job, and that job is to scrutinise and hold the Scottish Government to account. And that is regardless of party or constituency. And I often feel that, that, that this is a task that I'm personally feeling I do with one hand tied behind my back. And I'd like to start by relating some of the specific issues I'm referring to. On the 25th of November, for example, I submitted three separate questions to the government relating to the issue of the National Transition Training Fund. I received a single answer on the 6th of December, and not one of my questions was answered. I refer members to question reference S6W04621. This is just the tip of an iceberg of unsatisfactory parliamentary answers. Uh, yes, I will. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member very much for giving way. Would you accept that it works both ways and that some members, including himself, do misuse points of order? Uh, 
Stephen Kerr. I certainly don't agree with uh, John Mason in the slightest uh, in pr inappropriate use of uh, points of order. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, this is, uh, I just go back to my comment about parliamentary answers. Um, funnily, enough, funnily enough, I raised this as a point of order on the uh, 18th of November, and I think that is an appropriate point of order. I raised question S6W 01381 on the issue of suicide prevention and was told that the government did not maintain data on the topic. The lack of data held by the Scottish Government is a matter for a different day, but it speaks volumes that they are unable to answer such significant and important questions. I think all members deserve better answers. And I say to the committee, and I say to my friend, the convener of the committee, we need a revolution in parliamentary questions. Why, for example, do we need to read out the questions that are already printed in the business bulletin? Why do we need to lodge questions so far in advance? Next week, we have to lodge specific lodge questions to be answered three weeks from now. And why, or oh why do ministers not answer questions succinctly? They read out lengthy briefings that have obviously been prepared for them by civil servants and spads. Neil Gray. Thank you. Thanks, um, giving way. Um, on reading out of questions, and I understand the point where he's coming from, having previously served with him in Westminster, was there a different style around uh, reading out in, uh, in, uh, initial questions. But does he not accept that while we may understand what the initial question is, our constituents at home, some of them with accessibility issues, may not. And actually reading them out is very helpful to ensure that they know about what we're asking about and the proceedings that are coming forward. Stephen Kerr. Neil Gray makes, makes a very fair point. However, it's obvious from the answers that are given, the first answer that's given, and the supplementary, which is really the meat of the sandwich when it comes to asking parliamentary questions in a debating chamber. That, yes, I will. Daniel Johnson. Me, especially since he'd only just got back to, onto his feet. Is that not really the nub of the question, though, is in terms of the supplementaries? A supplementary should be impromptu, it should be a response, and therefore it should not be read out any more than the, the Minister's response to it. Is that not something we really need to tackle, the reading of supplementary questions? Stephen Kerr. I think that is a first-class point and an intervention that I definitely welcome. This, I will come on to talk further about spontaneity because spontaneity is what we need to develop in this chamber. I'm afraid that one of the reasons that, um, uh, that ministers uh, stick so rigidly to their answers, which I want to deal with that first, is because there's a degree of contempt from the government towards this parliament. Uh, I'll, I'll, give you, and I'll give you a current example. The First Minister last Friday announced various new measures, restrictions, substantive, policy matters relating to COVID-19 in a TV studio. And that's not the first time that's happened. Yes, happy to. Minister. It's a simple intervention. Does the member not actually believe that what he said is complete and utter nonsense? And it wasn't the actual case because we've had this discussion at Bureau on numerous occasions and he can't just seem to let things go. Can he not accept that what he's just said there was complete and utter nonsense? Well, Stephen Kerr. I'll tell you what's complete and utter nonsense, uh, Minister. That the Scottish Government claims that a press release, a statement issued by Public Health Scotland at five o'clock last Thursday, after this Parliament had risen, was somehow unknown to the Scottish Government, which is renowned for its grip and control of everything to do with its remit. So I would say that I would say that it's far from nonsense. I think it's highly irrelevant to this debate. And this is not the first time that the First Minister has resorted to a TV studio. I will give way one more time. I, 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 I think we need to train... Uh... Neil, Gray. Neil Gray. I thank the President Officer and Stephen Kerr for giving way. On, on uh, ministers reading out answers, I can understand um, Steve, where Stephen Kerr is coming from. However, does he not accept that this was a very similar occurrence uh, when we were serving in Westminster, where we had ministers reading out responses. And there are often very good reasons for it, which include legal and uh, ensuring that uh, correct information is given. And sometimes there has to be very carefully worded responses to some of the questions that we ask. Stephen Kerr. And, and Neil Gray knows well that had some of the ministers at the other place attempted to read the length of answers that we get in this place, the speaker would have been all over them. Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what doesn't happen here. And, and, and I think we need to have some 
uh, temperance on the part of the ministers when it comes to their, their answers. Um, now, this parliament is the forum of this nation. It should be respected. It isn't appropriate, in my opinion, uh, for the government to resort to external means of delivering substantial statements to the people of Scotland, other than in front of those who have been elected to represent the people of Scotland. And I would come in here on a Friday, a Saturday. Is this such an enormous privilege? to be a member of the Scottish Parliament. I would come in here on a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday, a Monday. I'd stay after six o'clock. I'd come in before two o'clock into this chamber to hear statements of such importance. And I know that many members, especially my colleagues, would be delighted to do so as well. Um, I, I want the members of this Parliament to know that we held six meetings of the Bureau in a very short period over the weekend. Uh, all of which were attempts on the part of the Labour Party and myself for the Conservatives to call a meeting of this parliament so that the First Minister could be scrutinised on what she said in a TV studio. But all of those attempts were blocked by the parties of government. That can't be right. No parliament should be so totally in the control of the executive that it can't meet to scrutinise the actions of the executive. It's just not right that a journalist from the Scottish Sun or the Daily Record um, uh, has the opportunity to scrutinise the First Minister and our government, but the Scottish Parliament didn't. And some might say, cynically, that the media might ask better questions than we do. But that's not the point. It is our responsibility. Can I give way one more time? No, I, um, I would just, could I just ask uh, Mr Kerr and the Minister both to take a seat? I will just um, remind members that the Bureau is a private discussion until the minutes are published. Um, the Parliamentary Bureau came to decisions that were taken forward. Um, I'll now allow the meeting to, to continue. Is Mr Kerr asking the Minister content to accept the Minister's intervention? Minister. Yes, I'm, I'm quite happy to intervene and give Mr Kerr some time to calm down and bring it down a couple of octaves. But uh, at the end of the day, the situation is, as you quite rightly said, President Officer, we had a discussion within Bureau, but there was no point of bringing the Parliament in when there was nothing new to say. And that was the whole point of the discussions we had. Mr Kerr seems to either have a lapse of memory or decides not to actually report what's been said. Stephen Kerr. I'm only reporting uh, factual information uh, to the Chamber about what occurred in those meetings. Uh, uh, and I respect what the presiding officer has said about the nature of those meetings, but when the minutes are published, if they have not already been published, they will show that we sought to have a meeting of Parliament. Um, so if I, I recognise now that I am testing the patience of, of uh, the uh, Presiding yes, officer. Yes, please do wind up. We, uh, we have yes, time why, in hand. Why, to I wind will up. do my best absolutely to wind up right now. Look, we have a culture of conformity in this place that needs to be broken. Members should feel free to stand up for principle greater than party loyalty. And I remind you that I am the chief whip from my party, so I take a risk in saying this. But they should stand up for party loyalty, uh, for something greater than party loyalty, for an idea, for representing a constituent or for championing a cause. Thank and there you, are Mr. many Kerr. other issues that I would like to raise. To, to conclude your remarks at that point. And I now call on Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, first of all, I do want to thank the members of the committee and their clerk for the work that they have done to produce this report, because I don't think it could be more timely. And I think the discussion we're having this afternoon has to be part of an ongoing discussion. And I also want to thank all our parliamentary staff for the fantastic work they have done to enable the change we've taken over the last few months and for enabling us to do safe working as an option throughout the pandemic, whether by socially distanced or virtual working. And as others have said, there have been huge challenges, but we have kept this place going. And I think that was absolutely critical because we're here to represent our constituents, to be able to raise the issues that they need answers on urgently and to ensure views are properly considered by this place. And critically, we're here to hold the Scottish Government to account as effectively as possible. And as others have started to get into a debate about, that means we need to make the maximum use of the time, not just in this chamber, but in our committees as well. 
So things like slots for opposition days, committee debates and members' business are absolutely critical because they're at the core of our scrutiny and representation because they're not automatically decided by the government, but there's a degree of conversation across the parties about how we use our time. I particularly want to focus on the issue of topical questions, presiding officer, because it feels in this term more flexible in terms of how topical questions are used. And I think they are an important way of members raising urgent issues rather than waiting for months for a response to a question from a minister. Now, that's partly, I suspect, about the level of letters we're all writing, but there is a real issue during the pandemic of urgent constituent concerns. And I think it would be worth considering we're adding another slot, maybe on Wednesdays, in addition to the slots we have on Tuesdays and the more flexibility that's been introduced on FMQs would be worthwhile. So I think there have been some very good changes. I think one of the things the presiding officers and the deputy presiding officers have all started saying to us is think about the brevity of our questions, but also to ministers, think about the brevity of answers. And I have been in both positions and I know that ministers do get incredibly lengthy options, but there is something about editing down and trying to cut to the chase. Um, and I think about um, making sure, go back to the point I made, we need to make the best use of our time in here because it is not infinite. And I'm going to come back to that. Um, if it is brief. Alexander Stewart, I should say we do have time in hand for interventions. I, I thank the member for taking the, the intervention. I very much concur with what the member is trying to indicate. Uh, there is no doubt there is frustration uh, from many members across this chamber that time constraints do not allow us to even sometimes get through the questions that are set uh, by the Parliament on, on working days. Uh, and I do believe that there is an opportunity for us to take more urgent and topical questions further during the week. Sarah Boyack. Yeah, very much thank the member for that helpful intervention. I think it is, you know, we've we're coming through a pandemic, we're not through it, so this is a good chance for us to think about how we do things with a fresh eye um, and to think about that point about why we are here. Um, th there's one thing I wanted to really focus on as well, which is it's already been mentioned that our, we can be proud of our parliament being diverse. It is the most diverse in our history, but that actually creates some challenges for us as well. And I want to comment particularly on how we make sure parliamentarians can fully participate in our work. And I think one of the, the key challenges we've had um, is about the last minute changes we quite often get in terms of parliamentary business and particularly in terms of decision times. And I think it's hugely disruptive to members who've got family or caring responsibilities. And I totally understand why it happens, but I think we need collectively to try and avoid it going, going forward as much as possible. Um, and I know from talking to colleagues that the impact in the last session had a massive disruption in people's family lives. So I'm glad to hear from Martin Whitfield that the committee is thinking about addressing this issue. But I do think it's critical because in the last parliament, we had experienced female MSPs who decided not to stand again. So I think we can be proud of the fact we've got the, the most representative parliament ever, but we've got to make it work on a day-to-day -day basis in, a, in a, an effective way. Again, if it's brief. Daniel Johnson, and I will reiterate there is time for intervention. Okay. I'm very grateful to Sarah Bayek for, for giving way on that point. And I, I would just ask her if she agrees with me that not only is it important that we, we kind of uh, uh, don't have endless flexibility of decision time, but hybrid procedure actually makes family life a lot more possible for many members who are parents, especially of younger uh, children. I'm wondering if she'd agree with that point. Um, definitely. And, and I can say that I'm not speaking from a point of personal interest here, but I've spoken to colleagues and I think we need to tackle this. Um, hybrid can also be a challenge, as I understand it, um, from members who have got younger members of the family who can appear unexpectedly, but we can live with that. The other thing I was going to say was that um, working in a hybrid way has actually been really important because it's actually enabled quite a few colleagues to be able to attend evening meetings, to deal with correspondence from our constituents and prepare for our committee meetings. So it's given us different options. That's something to reflect on. Uh, if it's very brief, yes, again. Finlay Carson. And, and I thank for taking the brief intervention. As, as a father, I, I, the most important thing to me is certainty. So if I know it's going to be six o'clock, that's fine. And whether that's hybrid or actually sit in the chamber here, it's to make sure my wife or, or my mother-in-law, whatever, know that I'm going to be home at five or six o'clock. In the last session, the biggest problem was the lack, of the lack of certainty over decision time, which was 
generally to do with the failures in the voting system. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. We, we, we should have a strong preference for keeping to our decision time and actually to keep it a, a re at a reasonable time as well. We can plan ahead by adjusting timings to give people as much advance notice as possible going forward. So it's good to see that there's cross-party agreement on that. The other thing I wanted to mention was the provision of childcare in the Parliament when we come out of the pandemic. I think that also needs to be considered going forward. And I welcome the fact there's been a questionnaire, but for visiting constituents, for staff and MSPs, I think it's something we need to go back and look at very carefully again, because there are many benefits to enabling parents, and particularly women, to be able to use this place as much as possible. And I think the SPICE briefing is really useful um, to just give us a sense of what we can learn from different approaches. And others have mentioned the use of proxy or remote voting for those who are ill, for maternity or paternity leave, or for those who have crisis childcare or caring responsibilities. And I, I hope the committee will look at that issue and also uh, as important guidance to make sure that if we did introduce those issues, that we would have um, guidance to prevent people abusing those options. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an issue there about ministers as well, which has been mentioned about about the unique responsibilities and duties that ministers have. So making sure that if we are more flexible, that we still make sure that we have the accountability feature absolutely built into how we operate. I wanted to briefly mention the issue of travel disruption because recent floods and storms, for example, have meant that roads and public transport services were cancelled. So I also think you have to think about future extreme weather issues on the capacity of colleagues to attend the parliament. Um, and I think it's also worth thinking about committees where most of the discussion in the chamber thus far has been about when we're in this room. But actually, being able to have witnesses giving us evidence without having to be in the committee room with us is a potential bonus. In the past, it's been done as a, as a very exceptional circumstance. Um, I know we once had a representative from the Northern Isles, but this morning we had witnesses from Brussels, Germany and London. It was an excellent session. I'm now being wound up. Um, I should not have taken those interventions. Um, I'm not suggesting we don't travel in the future, um, but we do need to make sure that we have a mix so that we still have the, the personal connectivity that works while also having the option of hybrid meetings going forward. And I think post COP26, I just want to briefly flag the issue of hybrid CPGs. I think that's something we should think about. Um, presiding officer, the last few months, all of our world, worlds have been turned upside down. But this is an opportunity today to think about how we change how we work, how we work more effectively, how we use our time as effectively as possible. And hopefully the committee will think about how we can learn from other approaches across the world. And I think although COVID has been a massive change, we need to seize the moment, think about what changes we can make Please and go back to our initial ambitions 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago about the parliament, it's making you. this democratic, accountable, and doing that to the Thank best you, of our Ms. ability. Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and, and apologies for not being quite ready. I'd like to begin by thanking the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee for bringing this debate today. It probably isn't going to be the most exciting debate of the year. No offence to any of the committee members or the committee and their work, but I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute this afternoon. How we conduct ourselves, how we do our business, and how we deal with the issues that we, we have to deal with in this place, how, how we work, are really, really important issues for us to consider. How we, build, how we can build on the hope and the optimism of the Parliament's beginnings, as, as Martin Whitfield has already outlined, how we serve our constituents, our communities and our country. These are vital issues because how we do our jobs is, as, in my view, as important as what we do in those roles. How we do what we do is about our culture, our culture of debate, our culture of engagement, our culture of inclusion, and all of this then contributes to the culture of politics. And I don't just mean the political discussions we have in this chamber or in committees in this building or in the email exchanges we have or on any of the other platforms we use regularly. More broadly, the culture we generate and sustain in all of these processes affects the trust and confidence that the people we are here to serve have, not only in us as in MSPs, but in politics more generally. 
So I want to give a bit of focus about, uh, about the culture of our debate and our exchanges, drawing on work done by the Young Academy of Scotland of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Yaz's Charter for Responsible Debate, on which, uh, of which I and several members in this place are signatories, aims to create a set of norms for debate that allow us to better make decisions together. It does this by setting a number of principles that underpin responsible, responsible debate. These principles are based on the belief that joint decision-making should be informed, respectful and inclusive. They speak to issues of accuracy, diversity and honesty. They require careful, empathetic listening, the use of respectful language and acknowledgement of persuasive points. They challenge us to communicate in ways that unite rather than divide, to address imbalances of power and to seek to identify common ground. I think we can all think of times when these principles have not been adhered to. We can all think of times when we ourselves have probably not met th those high standards. We have many very significant issues on which we need to reach agreement. Maybe not una unanimous agreement, but some way of coming to, to a place where we can move forward, ranging from the climate emergency to how we govern data, how we understand artificial intelligence and the impacts that it has on our lives and our freedoms and the freedoms of those we serve. So we have to create the conditions for debate where we can interact and adapt our positions. I'll take Tess White. Tess White. Thank, thank you for the intervention, taking the intervention. Um, bearing in mind the minister used first name terms for uh, an opposition colleague now in coalition. Um, do you think it's right that the Green Party should have the same allowances for questions and challenges in debate now that you're all one together? Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank Tess White for that intervention. She and many other, and everybody in this, in this chamber should be very, very well aware that we have a cooperation agreement with the Scottish Government that no, is not a full coalition. I know she is very fond of using, using that word, but that's not where we are. We remain, and my colleagues here in this chamber with me this afternoon, remain o opposition MSPs. So we, we, have, we have these important issues on which we need to reach agreement. We need to make sure that we can get to that point of agreement or that point of, of, of moving forward in a way that not only we can live with, but that takes our, our, our citizens, our, our constituents with us too. That is the aim. That is, that is the challenge for us in, 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 in this debate. We need to be informed which means we need to have a strong... Yes, I'll take the minister. Stephen Kerr. Very grateful to Maggie Chapman for giving way. Does she have any concerns about the Parliament's ability to hold the executive to account? Maggie Chapman. Thank you for that question. I think accountability is really, really important for all of us. We can all probably be frustrate, have been frustrated with how questions are answered, how, how, how issues are dealt with. But the, the way to deal with those frustrations is not to shout at each other across the chamber. The way to deal with those frustrations is to speak to each other uh, along the lines of those principles with respectful, open listening and empathetic, uh, with empathetic ears and, 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 and open listening. And I think there are many examples in this, in this place just in the last few months where, where that has been far from what we have seen in, in, in this room. So, back to those, th those three themes that help us think about the ways in which we, we, can, we can be better at the job that we have to do. We need to be informed, which means we need to have a strong understanding of risk. In this context, the recommendation of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's post-COVID commission that we create an institution to help us with foresighting and futures, I think is of vital importance. And I would welcome the committee's view on that uh, over the course of the coming months. We need, to seek, we need to be respectful of different viewpoints, allowing each other to change our minds, allowing each other to change our positions and not be ridiculed for that change. In conclusion, Ra Ms Chapman. Rather than seeking to reinforce our own position all the time. 
and we need to be diverse. And there's been much discussion already about how, how we can create the structures to hear the voices we don't always hear. And just in closing, presiding officer, I would like to put on record my immense thanks to the PACT team who do such incredible work for getting other voices into this building. That has to be one of the aims that, that we, 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 we take forward over the next parliamentary term. Thank you. Thank you. I call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak on this topic as a newly appointed member of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee, with only three meetings under my belt, but also as a new parliamentarian who has no real working experience of this place before the advent of COVID-19 and the pandemic. Of council chambers, I could write war and peace. But of this parliament, I know only of social distancing, teams, masks and blue jeans. Now, all of us who were virtual yesterday, we've already heard experienced what happens when a worldwide internet system crashes. And um, it was certainly frustrating and meant some who were remote were unable to deliver their speeches and those who were in the chamber endured delays and frustrations. But I don't characterise this as the norm of the virtual hybrid space that we currently inhabit. Sure, like many, I've experienced those sudden and intense etchy oakster moments, and that's how I'm going to explain them. They're etchy oakster moments when upon joining Blue Jeans, when a session's already in progress, and you're that weird little swirly thing up in the right-hand corner, in the left-hand corner, sorry, of everyone's screens, you cringe when your youngest enters the room and loudly demands a snack, or the dog turns into the hounds of the Baskervilles as a parcel has been delivered, or indeed your family chicken decides it wants five minutes of fame and hogs the airwaves, <laughs> rapidly detracting from the salient points you were trying really hard to communicate. But, presiding officers, these frustrations and sometimes amusing moments have been born with levity and a sense of pragmatism. We all recognise that in order for us to represent our constituents and for us to create impactful legislation and perform our scrutiny function, quickly ensuring remote working was possible has stood us in good stead. There is an old saying often used in Ayrshire, Huft is a good maester. Now, in order for the folk of Scotland to get the folk of Scotland through the pandemic, this place and all of its component parts had to respond swiftly to, by suspending standing orders, amending procedures, passing emergency legislation, all with an army of amazing tech support in the background, working night and day to create a virtual world previously unthinkable and often dismissed. Sometimes it takes an extreme event to provoke change. And it's now up to us to ponder what we want to keep and what we cannot wait to dispense with. Before coming to this place, I was COSA's community wellbeing spokesperson for several years, but not just a spokesperson, a co-spokesperson. I shared that role with Councillor Kelly Parry, who required support to be able to undertake maternity leave, just like any other women right across Scotland. It was, and still is, absolutely amazing to me that this had never happened previously at COSLA, nor indeed in any council setting, and it caused a bit of a stramash when the concept was first introduced. But Hufti is a good maester, and with the support of officers and council group leaders, the benefit to all of sharing that role between two councillors meant that she did not lose out on her role and her earnings to have a baby. Her right as a parent and as a woman were protected. By breaking out of the custom and practice, Kelly Parry and I helped to pave the way forward, and I see some parallels with what we must do now in this place. As a family-friendly legislator, we need to recognise that this country may be small, but it has constituencies and regions that mean some members travel nearly a whole day to get home. Indeed, I'm three hours to Ayrshire by train. Three hours. An hour and a half by car, but three hours by train. And the crash is currently closed due to the pandemic, but votes being held later and later would still have caused issue for the parents using that facility. So some form of continued hybrid system that can allow for parents to be at home, or indeed those of us who care for older or disabled relatives, must be on the cards. And again, I'm sure that many of you will have experienced the abject terror associated with remote voting when there's the usual after 5 p.m., everybody arriving home and demanding dinner, moments when you're shushing everyone and kicking them all out, including the dog from the room that you're in, as you try in vain to hear what the presiding officer is talking about and which vote we're on, especially if it's a stage three. But if that means a member can be at home breastfeeding a new baby or getting dinner ready for their elderly mother, then those are stressful moments I think are worth it. Widening access to this place for more women, young parents, those with disabilities, those with caring res responsibilities is a must. And this is one way that we can do it. As Sarah Boyack has already said, we just have to look at the talent that we lost as several MSPs did not stand again in 2021 as they could not get their balance 
of their work life, their constituency parliamentary duties to a place that ensured they could remain as MSPs. Think about all that talent loss for a moment. Yep. <laughs> Daniel Johnson. To the member, and I, and I, I very much agree with her points around virtual working, but I was just wondering if she would agree with me that we also have to bear in mind that virtual proceedings can actually be a disadvantage for certain people with disabilities, you know, such as those either with uh, sensory impairment or indeed people like me with ADHD who really struggle to stare at a screen. Eleanor Whitton. Yeah, I thank um, Daniel Johnson for that intervention, and I would absolutely agree, and I think that that's why we would need to have hybrid proceedings going forward, in my opinion, so that we actually look at everybody's needs and address them effectively. And whether that we, is, means we need to create some kind of um, justification as to why you need to be that way, as has already been mentioned by another member, that's absolutely fine. So I think it's hybrid and not one or the other, I think, is the, is the way forward for sure. And the same can also be said of those who are giving evidence to committees. We are hearing from new voices, voices for whom the trip to Edinburgh was too arduous, too expensive, and took too much time out of their days. And this evidence is invaluable and totally reflective of the wider population we serve, and indeed those international voices are hugely important too. And as we've already heard, this saves us money and costs, expenses, yeah, and also our carbon output. Yeah. Stephen Kerr. I wonder if the member might agree that while well, she's making very many fair points, it's very important that government ministers... Mr Kerr, could you that government, address the microphone? That, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's very hard to look this way and speak to someone over here, which is another thing we could discuss. Um, but uh, would the member agree that while she's making lots of fair points about the committee structure, it's still vitally important that government ministers appear in person before committees? rather than appear virtually, which is a very difficult format for scrutiny and holding ministers to account. Eleanor Whittam. I'm not so sure that I agree with that. I thank Stephen Kerr for the intervention. I've taken evidence from ministers um, and the, you know, the committees that I'm on so far. And I think that we've been able to scrutinise them quite fairly in that situation. And I think that if a minister is self-isolating or dealing with another illness, then their opportunity to give um, evidence shouldn't be taken away. But I do get that sometimes it's easier when they're in the room and you can see the whites of their eyes. So I do get that point as well. So before I finish, um, I would also like to, to mention the fact that Stephen Kerr did talk about being in here at any time and the ability to be recalled um, and that all of us should be up for that. I myself have a, a disability that means I can't do that um, and I wouldn't be able to do that. So I think we have to remember um, that you know, this is a family friendly and an MSP friendly, friendly situation we're in and we have to be mindful of, of everybody's situation. So, presiding officer, I look forward to hearing from colleagues um, and that there's going to be conflicting views. We've already seen that. It's been quite um, eye-opening so far. But let's get this evidence and this inquiry off to a roaring start. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Britton. I now call on Jackson Carlow, who will be followed by Daniel Johnson for uh, a generous six minutes, Mr. Carlow. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. I mean, I actually come to this with uh, no fixed agenda at all. I've been mulling over the issues involved. I'm very interested in the introductory speech from Martin Whitfield and thank him uh, for the debate that he has initiated. As someone, however, who has had an interest in parliamentary procedure in the years I've been here, uh, as the last serving MSP who sat on the Commission for Parliamentary Reform in the last session, uh, albeit Pam Duncan Glancy was there as a lay member, but also as someone who published a report, a rather contentious report at the end of my first uh, session here in 2011. Um, contentious, I say, because I observed as somebody who'd come from a business world to the parliament that I was surprised at the number of colleagues back then who turned up for work at the crack of noon and also at what I felt was a disproportionate workload between the work I did then as a regional member and the work constituency members appeared to do at that time. I actually think that's balanced in many respects over the years. But it, I, I made a couple of... I mean, a lot of the points I made actually subsequently um, were picked up and some came about in the Commission for Reform. But I, I was struck today when I looked at this to see... On First Minister's questions, I observed that what we have in First Minister's questions each week is 30 minutes of tedious verbal torture. Despite the repeated and determined efforts of the current presiding officer, there is clear need for procedural change. Well, we have reformed. Ken McIntosh made it 45 minutes of tedious verbal torture, and today we managed over an hour. Um, and I also noted that I said, quoted really something Lord Foulkes, who was a member of that parliament, um, said when he said we go through the pathetic uh, ministers of the chamber 
as comprising pathetic rituals of questions which are read often badly and answers drafted by civil servants with no apparent input from the minister delivering them. And I still feel some of those criticisms uh, are true today. I note, though, that um, nobody who joined this parliament in May has yet sat in it as a full chamber of members. Um, and, and that's regrettable. But I'm not sure how fundamentally important I've come to believe that is, because for all the reform in the Commission, the most radical reform of this Parliament was brought about by the events of the pandemic. It, it, reforms that we would never have contemplated in any other circumstance. And I actually think that the hybrid arrangement that we have arrived at uh, works very well. I find, as a constituency member, my time is far better deployed uh, by not being here on a day when I have no particular contribution to make. But, it, yes. Gillian Mackay. Would the member support retaining the hybrid working system going forward to allow more people to be able to access Parliament, as Eleanor Whittam said, either as... Um, either as a committee witnesses or as MSPs in the future? Yes, and I think those points, have been, these, those points have been well made, and I do support them. And that's not what I might have expected to hear myself say when we began this experiment. But I actually think that the hybrid arrangement has worked well. Uh, and I think it would be a retrograde step now uh, to decide that we cannot function. It has its faults. We've seen its positives and its negatives. I think the comment made by John Mason earlier about the ability to intervene uh, in a hybrid arrangement is a very valid one. Um, and sometimes, of course, the technology has failed uh, and that has caused its own issues. I might say and may consider, do we need to have decision time at the end of business or could we not have decision time at the start of the next day's business? Some might say that that would actually interrupt the vote and the passion of the debate, but we're having yesterday's votes tonight. Uh, and, I, you know, it would give much more fixed certainty if we knew that at two o'clock every day we were going to have decision time for the previous day's business uh, without there then being this extended uncertainty as to when decision time might come. Um, so I do think, though... Yes, of course, Mr. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Jackson Cole for doing this. Could I push you on a point over the way that we vote? And I ask this really just to, to listen to your to your answer, which was Through another chair, event please, that was being Whitfield. changed by COVID, so electronic voting. Sorry, I, I actually missed that. <laughs> Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, could you direct the comments through the Sorry, chair? My, my apology, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, would Jackson Carlo um, give his view on the use of electronic voting, which was another thing brought in by COVID? Jackson Carlo. So, no, I, I, I'm in favour of the electronic voting. I think it follows that in being able to deploy my time as a constituency member more efficiently and not being here on certain days where I am not contributing to the proceedings of Parliament, uh, being able to vote remotely is a fundamental part of that. Uh, if we move to a more permanent arrangement where that is allowed, then I hope we will be able to evolve more robust technology so that we can rely upon that. And I should say that I was slightly concerned yesterday that parliamentary proceedings went ahead when it became apparent that the Blue Jeans network had failed. Because I'm not sure that as a corporate body, we have approved that as an operational practice for the Parliament. My understanding is that we have approved a hybrid process for Parliament, and that hybrid process, so far as I know, does not include a provision that you can watch the proceedings on television and that that is in any way satisfactory. So, in some senses, I mean, if we are going to have a hybrid arrangement, it has to work within rules and not be adjusted in a completely ad hoc basis, as I think we ended up doing yesterday. But as my time's coming to an end, I just want to finish with one particular point. And it relates back to those lengthy answers and those lengthy questions. One of the problems that the Commission established is that the presiding officer's powers are limited. It would require this Parliament to agree to enhance the power of the presiding officer to that equivalent to the Speaker of the Irish Republic Parliament, where he is able to set a limit of 90 seconds on ministerial responses, after which their microphone switches off, and he is also able to say to ministers that they have not answered the question. Now, when I spoke to the speaker, he said that in practice, he never had to do either because ministers had disciplined themselves now to answer within 90 seconds. And ministers also disciplined themselves to answer the question because being upbraided in the chamber for not doing so was seen as a serious offence against parliament. 
But for us to have something similar, to come back to Sarah Boyack's point about concise answers and concise questions, I don't know what the time limit would be, but unfortunately this voluntary arrangement or admonition to us all to proceed on that basis has never been successfully achieved or implemented. It would require us, if we think that important, to have a procedural change and to enhance the power of the Chair to do it. I personally am in favour of that because I do think at times as we struggle along with interminable, not questions and answers, but speeches and speeches, it is undermining the cut and thrust and I think the import of the job that we are trying to do. So I throw, offer those contributions simply because Mr Whitfield has said this is the beginning of a process and a debate, and those are some of the thoughts I've had in the time that I've been here. Thank you, Mr Carlo. As you proceeded to talk about the enhancing of the powers of the presiding office, I was disappointed to see you stop, but stop you must. Um, Daniel Johnson to be followed by Neil Gray. And then six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I found the opening remarks from uh, my friend Martin Whitfield, the convener of the committee, I think uh, 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 very interesting and very important. I, I think the question about what kind of parliament do we want this to be is one that we need to keep asking ourselves. Because I very much find myself in wonder that I'm in the place that I hoped would come into being in the 1990s. I was someone that passionately believed in the, the need uh, and indeed uh, the importance of having a Scottish parliament. But I think we need to ask ourselves whether or not this place lives up to both the promise of parliaments as, uh, in general, but also, I think, the, the potential of the Scottish Parliament in particular. You know, I think we need to think about what, what makes a good parliament, but also, are we doing politics differently? Because I think that was what many of us hoped would happen when we created a Scottish Parliament. And unfortunately, I think some of the things that we put in place to bring about the latter have actually stymied the former. I think some of the, the rules and the practices and procedures has actually prevented the sort of flow of debate, I think some of the reflection that we need, and I think our, ultimately our ability to hold the Parliament to account. And I think we've already heard some thoughts about that from some of the contributions, but actually particularly I was interested by Maggie Chapman, and, and I think her points around I think the way we conduct debate, the culture of debate being important, and actually particularly about reflection. Because ultimately, actually what's important in this place is not debate per se, is actually about reflection and dialogue. I think something that is sometimes missed is this place is not just a platform for delivering speeches. It's actually meant to be a, 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 a space where ideas are exchanged and there's the possibility of changing minds. That's the difference between parliamentary democracy and presidential democracy, where actually all it's about is holding the executive to account. And it's the difference between parliamentary democracy and direct democracy, where essentially you're just making decisions, but not necessarily providing that space for reflection. And I think what is really important is that we consider, are we doing that? And I, let me just say one, one sort of slightly impudent, but I think important thing. I think if there's one change I could make in this chamber, I'd get rid of these things. These lecterns hold us back. These lecterns mean that people come here and read out speeches. Now, I know it's difficult, but ultimately, if the words you say in this space have not changed from the night before when you typed them out, we're doing something wrong. Okay. I think it's, uh, uh, just a moment, I think it's really important that, that when we debate, we, pr we give the possibility of changing our views and our minds. And I'll give way to Eleanor Whittam. Thank for giving way on that. Would the member agree with me, though, that there are some circumstances where we need to have a speech in front of us? I myself are going through menopause, and there'll be other women in this place that are going through menopause, and I lose my train of thought if a hot flush overtakes me, as has happened several times in here. And if I did not have my words in front of me, I actually might have ended up greeting and sitting back down. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. And I thank uh, the member for that intervention. We certainly don't want to a greeting uh, after making a contribution. Uh, but I think, and she makes an important point. I'm not saying no words. Uh, what I'm saying is perhaps we can consider rules where people are actually encouraged to refer to other contributions in the chamber. The, uh, standing, and I'll give way in a moment. I was standing on to say that you have to be relevant. I would argue that by being relevant is that you should be reflecting what other members have already previously said in the chamber. Indeed, I also think we should maybe think about the timings and whether or not to get your full time, you should perhaps have to take interventions. Mr Kerr. Stephen Kerr. Very grateful for this very thoughtful contribution. I would point out that Winston Churchill, no less, wrote out his speeches 
and referred extensively to his notes. And I don't think anyone would criticise his debating style. And I don't think that is what the member is saying by, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. But I would suggest him, I would invite him to give some thoughts on the very fact that the, 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 the speakers who appear in this chamber in debates have been somehow chosen by their business managers. And that seems very strange to me as an, an incomer to Parliament, that the, the parties are stage managing the debates themselves. What's the, what are his thoughts on that? Daniel Johnson. I, I very much agree with that. Uh, and I actually think some of the points made by uh, Jackson and Carlo are really important and were points I was going to come on to. Is actually, I think we need to think quite carefully about the role of the chair. I, I actually think we need to empower the role of the presiding officer to determine whether things are, are, are relevant. I, I think to, to actually shape the, the, the time given to agenda items so that actually if, if, if things transpire and need to be given more importance that they are given to them uh, uh, and I actually ultimately make the determination whether or not answers as well as questions are relevant. I, I also do, and I have already mentioned this in an intervention, wonder whether or not, it, it, certainly I can understand the need for, for notes for speeches, but for supplementaries I really would wonder whether or not it would not be more helpful uh, and indeed help spontaneity if we discourage that practice in this place. But I think the point around the, the role of the presiding officer is, is important for another point, is that I think this place is at times guilty of proceduralism. I think when this place came into being, we were determined to get rid of the, the flamboyant flummery and, and, and all the nonsense that happens in Westminster. But by the same token, I think we've actually extinguished flexibility and the ability of this parliament to be dynamic. And I think critically, some of the structures, such as the Bureau, such as the role of the business managers, and indeed to some extent the role of the clerks, have actually uh, stymied debate. I think sometimes Bureau can be little more than a, a formalised, smoke-filled room and clerks acting as gatekeepers. And I think we need to take back a bit of control and, uh, as parliamentarians, and indeed I think we need to empower the presiding uh, officer a, 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 a bit more. Um, I, I, I realise I'm running out of time, but I think the one point I'd just like to make is I think we must hold on to hybrid proceedings. But I think the one point I would make, just in, in contrast to some of the others, the key point is if we get these things right, it's not the issue with hybrid proceedings isn't that they're, they're remote, it's actually about those other points about relevance and making sure that people are relevant to the debate. I think we get that right, some of those issues would get taken care of. But I think the points made about... Uh, the, the, the being able to be consistent about decision time but flexible about how we meet around it are absolutely vital. I wish I had more time because I'd like to talk more about it but I, I think these are some of the most critical points as we consider these issues. Thank you very much Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed uh, Mr Johnson. I feel as if I ought to leap to the defence of the clerks who are unable to contribute to this debate but I, I will not. I'll pass on to Neil Gray who will be followed by Tess White around six minutes. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and it's a pleasure to follow uh, Daniel Johnson as I uh, do so uh, reading from my heavily annotated notes. Um, but I say when he's looking to empower uh, the Presiding Officer, I say with some self-interest, why stop there? Why not look with, at the committee chairs as well? Um, and I think those are some points that we should all be looking at. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking in this debate, um, and I thank colleagues on the Standards Committee for bringing it to the Chamber today. It's offered me the opportunity to reflect on my first six months uh, here and compare it to my previous six years um, at Westminster. And like all workplaces, the Scottish Parliament has had to make major changes to its way of working to ensure we keep people safe during the pandemic while also doing the important work we do, scrutinising government and raising concerns of our constituents. And it's been crucial to keep MSPs, our staff, the staff of Parliament and everyone involved in the running of this place safe that we have kept our hybrid proceedings going. And I reiterate um, our thanks to the staff for everything that they have done and continue to do uh, in implementing that. That safety first approach is now paying off as we face the rise of Omicron. And because we have a hybrid parliament, I've been able to keep doing my work while limiting the amount of times I've had to be here, which is also reducing the number of times I've been using public transport to get here. It's the sensible thing for us to do, and I find it crazy that for months now, Westminster has still been cramming people in into narrow benches and voting lobbies. But hybrid working has also increased opportunities for us to engage more widely. In the Social Justice and Social Security Committee that I chair, we have heard from people with lived experience of poverty and debt and fuel poverty that we otherwise would not have for a number of reasons. As welcoming an institution as this is, with wonderful staff, it can still be an intimidating place 
to contemplate coming to uh, sitting opposite a group of MSPs. It can also be a major challenge to get uh, people here with a ge wide enough geographical spread and difficult for people with dif disabilities or caring responsibilities to take part in our proceedings. Obviously, we want as many people as possible to visit our Parliament and to experience it, but there is no doubt virtual proceedings have broken down many barriers and really enriched the evidence we receive on behalf on the crucial issues we are interrogating. Yes. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer, and thank you to Neil Gray for giving way. I have had the pleasure of observing Neil Gray at work in the House of Commons, where he has been very much a vibrant contributor, was a vibrant con con contributor to the House of Commons. Does he not accept that this hybrid arrangement, the virtual setting, does not facilitate the type of debate that I know he much enjoyed in the other House. Neil Green. Uh, yes, I did indeed. Uh, but I also lament the fact that my colleagues like Amy Callaghan have been blocked from being able to take part in debates because of their illness uh, and because of the fact that they're not able to travel. So I think that there is a real lesson to be learned there for Westminster colleagues. And from a family-friendly perspective, hybrid working has also been transformational. How many of our colleagues that we lost at the end of the last session might have stayed if virtual voting and participation had been in place prior to the pandemic. It gives us, all of us, much more flexibility to do our jobs well, as Jackson Carlaw rightly said. Just as being stuck in London at three or four days a week meant I could not keep the family and constituency plates spinning as fast as the parliamentary one, so it must be for many other colleagues, uh, yourself, presiding officer, uh, who have to stay overnight in Holyrood uh, and stay overnight in Edinburgh. Of course, we all want to be here in person to make our contributions, but having the virtual option is so important for us to be effective both here and in the areas we represent, as well as making sure we are also being there for our families too. I give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I would, uh, first of all, thank you, for, for, thank you for giving way and completely echo his points, but does he, would he also consider that we need to also reflect about how we improve hybrid uh, working to allow interventions to ensure the relevance. And can I also sneak in my agreement with the committee convener point and ask him if he agrees with me that committee conveners should be elected by members of this parliament? Neil Gray. I, I think that's absolutely something that the standards committee, uh, committee should be uh, looking into. And in terms of the uh, debating point, in terms of intervening on, on colleagues using the technology, again, I think you're know, reflecting on what John Mason uh, had previously said. I think that it's absolutely right that rather than uh, try to do away with the technology because we want to, uh, we want to see uh, better debate. I think we improve the technology and I think that is the way we go about it. So we must reflect as an in institution that four incredibly able MSPs in Aileen Campbell, Jenny Mara, Gail Ross, Ruth Davidson, all cited an inability to balance Holyrood with family life as the reason for standing down. We should never allow ourselves to be in that situation again. It frankly shames us that we didn't do more to ensure they felt that they could stand for election again. How many more would have if we had the technology? A linked area of concern that I do have where I feel we have gone backwards is around the apparent fluidity of our fixed voting time. And I absolutely concur with Sarah Boyack uh, on this point. Uh, having a fixed voting time gives certainty to all of us when colleagues have caring responsibilities. Sometimes there are understandable reasons for why the voting time must shift, for technical reasons out with our control or if there's an emergency statement or piece of legislation, uh, but we must do better. Um, I, I have to say, as a father of four, it has certainly been challenging for me in the careful logistical childcare uh, balancing act at home, having such a shifting uh, uh, voting time, but it also has implications for our staff and the staff of Parliament. Uh, and again, I reiterate, I'm fortunate. I live a 20-minute train journey away. It's much more challenging for colleagues who are further away. Again, in response to what Sarah Boyack said regarding childcare, I welcome the fact that we have a, a consultation open on that, but I lament the fact that we are still only looking at a three- or four-hour uh, window of opportunity. If we had a much longer period of time, uh, I think people like myself might be able to enjoy uh, that service being available. So, in conclusion, presiding officer. I think hybrid working has enhanced our parliament. It has made us even more relevant, accessible and relatable. It has given all of us with caring responsibilities or geographical challenges the opportunity for more flexibility to do our jobs well, and it has helped to ensure that we can contribute equally without the discrimination we see at Westminster and keeps us and everyone working in parliament 
safer during the pandemic. We must reflect, as Daniel Johnson said at the start of his speech, at what we want to be as a parliament, where our priorities lie. I hope that remains as being a family-friendly parliament, and I very much welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate. Thank Martin Whitfield for bringing it, and I very much look forward to further engagement with the committee as it does its work. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Gray. I now call on Tess White to be followed by Cocab Stewart. Six minutes. Thank you, Presiding White. Officer. I too am proud to be a member of the Parliament. It's a diverse Parliament with 45% women and we're working to make it more inclusive. So I'd like to say I don't want to be dictated to and I also want my lectern up. So, starting, Presiding Officer. This debate is set against the background of public health constraints necessitated by the outbreak of COVID-19 and how the Scottish Parliament has adapted its procedures and practices to meet these challenges. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank parliamentary staff for the support they've provided to all the MSPs, myself included, during the pandemic, which has allowed this legislature to operate safely at a time of crisis and deep uncertainty. Presiding officer, more than two decades after the Scottish Parliament was created, today's debate is an opportunity to look at how it operates, not just during COVID-19, but more generally. It is, after all, a nascent Parliament, and one steeped in history, and it does have very high expectations. There is a wide spectrum of parliamentary experience in this chamber. For my part, I'm contributing as a new MSP with what I hope is a fresh pair of eyes. The Parliament was created 22 years ago to address a perceived democratic deficit in Scottish politics. I too was interested in the reply from Maggie Chapman on culture. Regarding a, a democratic deficit, however, a, a different kind exists now. Rather than spontaneous debate, as my colleagues have pointed out, too often, it's scripted, with the First Minister reading out prepared answers to planted questions from SNP backbenchers, and responses are often drawn out to fill the time. Just a few weeks ago, when the First Minister read out the wrong pre-scripted answer, not once, but twice in two weeks, the presiding officer um, advised that the content of MSP's contributions is not a matter for her. But MSPs are often pulled up by the presiding officers on the relevance of their contributions in the context of parliamentary debates. It should follow that if a representative of the Scottish Government fails to answer a question posed to them, they too should be reproached. As we've been reminded this week, the threat of COVID-19 still looms large. It's more important than ever that MSPs can scrutinise the decision-making and actions of the Scottish Government. But far too frequently, we have seen the First Minister announce new, restriction for, new restrictions from a podium during a press conference, not in Parliament. In June this year, the Scottish Government's decision to impose a Scotland-Manchester travel ban had a direct bearing on the northeast of Scotland, when EasyJet decided it was no longer commercially feasible to operate a new route between Aberdeen and Manchester. The travel ban was announced by the First Minister on a Friday, which was a non-sitting day, during a press conference with no opportunity for scrutiny by MSPs. It was a contemptuous move. Worryingly, too, is the Scottish Government's evasiveness in written answers to parliamentary questions, as well as the time it takes to respond to them. Issues highlighted by the SPPA Gov Committee's legacy report. I personally, I lodged a question on the maintenance of hospital estates on the 20th of September, especially important because of what's been happening at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. I didn't receive a response until the 15th of November, almost two months later. Standing orders require that written questions receive a response within 10 working days. And it's actually, it's just not good enough. Too often, presiding officer, this parliament is sidelined by this SNP Green government. It shouldn't be allowed to happen. But when the Scottish government does engage with the parliamentary process, we often find ourselves debating matters outside of the, of the parliament's devolved remit as part of a grievance-stoking exercise. 
That's not the type of accountability that, that the public deserves or expects. Presiding officer, in the limited time I have, my final comment relates to parliamentary privilege. It's well known that MSPs do not have the same parliamentary privileges as our Westminster counterparts. To facilitate free speech and have effective scrutiny, I would encourage the SPPA committee to reflect deeply. I'm in my last, you could have done it earlier. Um, sorry. I can give you the time back. Um, right. Yes, I'll take an intervention, Mr Johnson. Go for it. Daniel Johnson. I, I'm, I'm very grateful and I'll be very brief. Uh, the, the New Zealand Parliament recently passed an act, uh, 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 I think, uh, entrenching uh, parliamentary privilege. Does she believe that that could act as a, a model for this Parliament and should it be studied uh, by this Parliament? Tess White. Mr Johnson, that's a very good question. So there are good examples from the New Zealand Parliament. This morning during our committee meeting, we had some good example from the Canadian Parliament. I think the role of our committee is to club together different ideas. We've got, uh, Ms. Whittam joined us a month, a few weeks ago. We've got a, uh, now we're a diverse committee. We've got two members, uh, uh, two, two women members, three men, diverse with different experiences. Take New Zealand, take Canada, and take other parts of the world that have best practices, and we'll pull that and discuss them. It's well known that MSPs do not have the same parliamentary privileges, so we do need to look at it, and I'm glad that the, the member agrees with me here. What we need to do is extend parliamentary privileges for MSPs, and we can look at other countries. As a member of the SPPA committee, I hope that the remit of the inquiry will undertake it, that we will undertake in 2022 encompasses these issues and other issues. And then finally, presiding officer, to ensure that we serve the constituents to the best of our ability, to ensure we can effectively and robustly scrutinise legislation, and to ensure we can hold the Scottish Government to account, it follows that we must honestly evaluate how this Parliament works and how it can work better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms White. I now call Cocab Stewart to be followed by Graham Simpson again around six minutes. Ms Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, it's a pleasure to take part in this lively and timely debate. And words that I didn't think I would say in solidarity with Tess White, I am also going to use my lectern. Um, the inquiry um, has brought about the potential to make considered recommendations of how this Parliament works, and not just for us as members, but also the people that we serve as elected representatives. I'd like to focus on three important issues which I would urge the committee to investigate in depth. The work of the committees, the flexible working and support for parliamentarians. As one of the newest members of the Parliament, I've only ever experienced the current procedures and practices as they stand now. Um, I welcome the views of more experienced members and to my colleague Neil Gray for his experience of the House of Commons, no matter how archaic it sounds to uh, people like myself in particular. Mentioning the House of Commons, um, as often we do, it's held up as a model of good governance and parliamentary effectiveness. But I can understand why the Consultative Steering Group um, was adamant in 1999 that a new Scottish Parliament must be better. The CSG's got its principles right. To paraphrase, the Scottish Parliament should embody and reflect the sharing of power between the people of Scotland, the legislators and government. Be accountable to the people of Scotland, be accessible, open and participative in the development, consideration and scrutiny of policy and legislation. And, of course, the need to promote equal opportunities in all its operations. As the first woman of colour to be elected to this Parliament, I recognise that the fourth principle has taken a bit of time, um, but this place is looking and sounding more like the communities that we are serving. But there is much more to do. Nothing about us without us. The first two principles of sharing power and being accountable to the people are often regarded as the taken for granted element of a fully functioning legislature. And I hope that we will take the time to take stock of that. However, it's the third principle, being open and accessible, that I believe this impending inquiry is most relevant to. 
We truly live in a digital age. In the COVID backdrop overnight, we became accustomed to online meetings of all shapes and sizes, to online teaching, to children of all shapes and sizes. Um, and ICT has evolved beyond expectations. Last night, I read the report of the nine original CSG members who met in 2019 at the Festival of Politics to reflect on how their original report after two decades of implementation, and it makes for interesting reading. For instance, it was always envisaged that committees would be more powerful, consensual and innovative in developing policy. Now, through successive Scotland Acts, the volume of legislative business has increased way beyond what the Consultative Steering Group had envisaged. And as a consequence, the more aspirational role of our committees may have got lost somewhat. Perhaps, presiding officer, now is the time for a subject committee which will have no involvement in scrutinising proposed legislation, but to focus purely on how the ideals of the CSG can be enacted in light of what we know now. In terms of the practicalities of conducting parliamentary business, hybrid meetings and online meetings, they have been a blessing for many, and I know for some of our more experienced members of this chamber, they may have misgivings. But remember, you know, I have not experienced any other way. The current procedures have demonstrated to Scotland that our democracy can work from our kitchen as well as from this chamber. The Scottish Parliament's original design included the need to be more family friendly in its working hours. And frankly, that has been eroded. In hybrid and online meetings can contribute to achieving that specific aim alone, then that's a lesson we can benefit from. I know that some may have concerns about cost, but ask yourself this, what is the cost of not being flexible? What is the cost of not being inclusive? I do hope the committee can explore the economics of the current parliamentary practices, but balance these against the social cost of non-inclusive practices. Lastly, being an effective parliamentarian does require good support systems as well as the flexibility to be able to respond and engage with constituents and stakeholders. So it is much about the team of staff that us parliamentarians employ to help us carry out our duties. I urge the committee to broaden its remit of the inquiry to consider the impact um, uh, of the procedures and practices of Parliament on MSP staff as much as the elected members. I would like to see a broader, a broader range of data and evidence to be gathered in investigating the impact of our current practices on the staff of the corporate body as well as the staff employed through members' resources. There's lots of anecdotal evidence, but perhaps now is the time for a committee to commission its own research, either directly or through the corporate body. In conclusion, if there is one thing that the status quo is teaching me, it is that one size uh, fits all approach to chamber and committee procedures does not necessarily make for good governance. I haven't heard anything that suggests parliamentary democracy can only be effective if you're actually physically present. The committee's uh, remit uh, should be broadened uh, to fulfil the uh, consultative steering group's aim, include everyone who plays a part in a democratic ecosystem. And in finishing, perhaps we all need to rely more on the robustness of debate rather than the robustness of our tables. And perhaps we all need to talk a little more softly and listen a little bit more loudly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stewart. I now call the final speaker in the open debate, uh, Graham Simpson, for around six minutes. Well, that, that, that's extremely generous, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wasn't planning on speaking for six minutes at all. Up to uh, six but, minutes. Uh, but... Yes, it's up to six minutes. I'm actually um, uh, a rarity uh, in, in this debate uh, in that I'm not uh, on the whip. Um, you, you do not often come across uh, any speaker in this parliament who is not on the whip, um, because normally, uh, certainly in my group, uh, Mr Kerr, would be uh, choosing who gets to speak and who doesn't. I was not on that list. So I had to approach uh, the presiding officer 
um, and your good office said uh, that I could speak. That doesn't normally happen. Uh, and that seems to me uh, entirely wrong, that all parties need to look at their practices and allow people who, like me, um, saw the subject of the debate and uh, ha felt I had something to contribute to do so. Indeed. John Mason. Yeah, and I thank the member for giving way, and I agree, I think, to some extent with what he says. Would you agree that it is also up to backbenchers to challenge, to some extent, the front benches of their own parties? Graeme Simpson. Well, how refreshing to hear an SNP backbencher say that. Um, yes, I do agree with that. The other constraint, uh, and this has uh, come up, uh, and, uh, and you, presiding officer, said right at the start, well, just, just a sec, um, allow me to make this point at least. Um, and that is around the time limit of speeches. And it's come up, uh, um, actually, Stephen Kerr mentioned spontaneity during the debate. Daniel Johnson uh, has mentioned this uh, as well. Um, because MSPs are very often limited by time, and that is why they write speeches out, I think, um, so that they can fit in with that time. If we were more flexible, uh, well, I think Mr Whitfield wants it in first. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to Graeme Simpson giving way. Would you agree with me that this is perhaps one of the conventions that has grown up with regard to uh, individuals in parties dictating who speaks rather than actually anything contained within the standing orders? And indeed, could I ask what his view would be if there was a declining time for people to speak later in debates, but to allow a broader number of people to contribute? Graeme Simpson. I think that's an, an idea worth looking at, because I think the more contributors, the better. And one of the, be one of the good things about this debate so far is I think we've heard uh, a lot of really good contributions, uh, interventions have been made because people haven't felt constrained by time. Uh, and that's been, uh, that's been really good. I believe Mr Kerr wanted in. Stephen Kerr. I'm going to make a point very... I was going to make a point very I wish I had eyes in the back of my head. Um, I was Not going to make just a for point. making these sorts of interventions, I doubt. Sorry? <laughs> I was going to make a very similar point to uh, the point that Martin Whitfield made, but I, I wanted to point out that, in fact, it's not a convention that, uh, as such, that the parties choose the speakers, because every week you get an email asking you to submit the lists of the speakers. So it's all very controlled. And isn't that aspect of party control the very thing that's driving out the spontaneity that this place badly needs? Graham Simpson. Uh, well, I completely agree. And, uh, of course, Mr Kerr could uh, take a lead in that uh, in our own party, uh, perhaps uh, in introduce some uh, reforms to our own whip's office and uh, allow more spontaneity. I look forward to that happening. Um, the reason, uh, the reason uh, I wanted to speak today, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, is because I'll be introducing uh, a member's bill, a consultation on a member's bill um, in January. Uh, and one aspect of that bill Cuts, cuts right across um, some of the issues that have been discussed today. And I think ultimately, um, if it gets beyond the consultation stage, uh, we'll come to the Standards Committee. Um, and there are a number of aspects to the bill, but I'll just discuss uh, briefly uh, one aspect, which was what got me started. Uh, and that, that is the... Um, what I wanted to do was replicate the situation that councillors have if councillors do not turn up for work or do not do any work for six months, then they can be removed as councillors, and that is a matter of law. Uh, and that does not apply to MSPs. And so, I, so it, it struck me that that was uh, entirely wrong. If somebody just decides not to stop work effectively, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do that job. Now, that simple idea occurred to me before the pandemic. Since then, of course, we have changed the way we work. But I've proceeded with the bill. The consultation uh, will, will deal with some of the issues that have been discussed today. And one of the big question is now, of course, what constitutes work? It was quite easy before. You, you, know, you just had to turn up. You had to come here, vote, or take part in proceedings here. Now it's, now it's not so simple. 
So the consultation paper will raise these questions and I would encourage uh, all members, certainly all members who have taken part today, who obviously have a keen interest, to contribute because I'm genuinely interested in people's views. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful, and this is somewhat of a cheeky intervention. It's actually the real point that actually doing this job properly is a great deal more than simply showing up and voting. Graham Simpson. Well, absolutely. And the consultation does address those points, so I'd encourage Mr Johnson to take part in it. I've gone over my time. Um, I didn't expect to do that. So at that point, I will sit down, but it's been a fascinating debate, and I look forward to engaging with the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. Never a doubt that you'd fill the six minutes. And uh, we now move to the wind-up speeches, and I call Paul Sweeney for around six minutes, I think. Well, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been a great pleasure to, to listen to members' contributions today to an extremely important debate. Um, and, of course, uh, thanks in particular to the convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee for bringing this debate to the Chamber today uh, and his reflections on the initial ideas behind the, the establishment of the Scottish Parliament and the Constitutional Convention that gave birth to it, and particularly Donald Dewar's reflections on the idea of quality of debate being essential to the performance of the legislature. And of course, I'm also minded of uh, Ron Davies, the former Secretary of State for Wales's comment that devolution was a process not an event. So we can't simply be prisoners to the initial ideas about what the Parliament should be like. It should be a constant iteration. Um, it should be a constant responsive, responsive institution. And I think this debate is necessary to reflect on how things have done well over the last 21 years, but also things that can be reformed and changed as well. Um, and I think members have offered some really worthwhile contributions in that regard. I think some of the common themes that came out, certainly uh, the Green Member from North East, mentioned the, the tone of debate and the, the, the quality of being able to disagree well. And I think that's something we can all reflect on and how to do that better in the Chamber. But also, I think fundamentally, the, the common themes that seem to come out today from members was the role of the MSP. How does that work? And the inherent tensions that the job presents. Um, simultaneously, a member of the Scottish Parliament is a legislator, is a scrutiny, uh, as a scrutineer of government and committee. Uh, and also has to undertake the duties of um, representing the people as a constituency or regional representative in this place, and also effectively a community troubleshooter, uh, leader, campaigner. Uh, it's quite a, a hybrid role <laughs> and requires a, a myriad different set of skills. And some people are better at some things than others. Uh, and it does require a significant level of capacity um, that often comes at significant personal cost, as we've heard from members today. Um, I think the, the, the Minister for Parliamentary Business made some good points about the huge learning curves that have been achieved over the last year by the, the, the institution as a whole um, in requiring to build virtually from scratch an online system um, for participation and then moving towards this hybrid parliament. And I think there's been a broad consensus that that is something that has been highly effective uh, at opening and improving the performance of the, the legislature and is something we definitely want to build on and improve on in the future. Um, I think it's important to recognise the purpose of the Scottish Parliament and its foundations, and I think that kind of drives at the heart of some of the tensions described between the executive and the legislature and the roles performed there. And devolution wasn't just this big bang event in 1999 where suddenly everything was devolved from Westminster, actually. Administrative devolution, in effect, of the Scottish Government has existed as a discrete body of power since 1885 with the creation of the Scotland Office and the Secretary of State for Scotland was created in 1926. Of course, the construction of St Andrew's House up in Calton Hill was a direct result of that being built between 1935 and 1939. So I think we have to recognise that the evolution of how Scotland's governance has evolved is something that actually needs to be reflected on. What this Parliament's purpose is, is not simply to sit here as a forum for ministers to broadcast their views on things. It's very much a vigorous forum for the scrutiny of, an, of government power, and that is something that some, seems to be somewhat forgotten, uh, I think, in the last 20 years. Happy to give away. Daniel Johnston. Uh, uh, indeed, I'm very grateful to him. And would you agree with me that we need to re-examine our standing orders, and particularly about what is a, a, a relevant comment, and actually requiring both ministers and members that their comments are, are, are relevant and germane to the topic of uh, debate at the moment, and that might improve the quality of debate? Paul Sweeney. Absolutely, and I was struck by the member for Eastwood's uh, mention about the Doyle uh, and the Speaker and the Doyle's um, privileges and being able to hold ministers to account in terms of time limits on responses, but also the relevance of the contributions. And I think that is something that is well worth further inquiry 
Um, I also wanted to reflect on the nature of the Scottish Parliament being a, a, an evolution out of what was once the Scottish Grand Committee in the House of Commons. And actually, in a way, the House of Commons is so constrained by time uh, that the Scottish Grand Committee wasn't able to effectively perform the duties of a legislature, hence the creation of the Scottish Parliament. But there are still those constraints that we have to deal with on the capacity of the legislature to hold government to account. And I think a lot of those frustrations were expressed today, such as topical questions, be able to hold government to account, adding capacity and flexibility. The time constraints on First Minister's questions, for example, um, perhaps having the government having prior sight of people's questions gives a degree of intelligence that isn't, for example, afforded to the Prime Minister. If Prime Minister's questions, in fact, you get a sudden death hit, uh, and the Prime Minister just has to simply be very responsive at dealing with that because he doesn't have any prior, or he or she doesn't have any prior um, knowledge of what's going to be put forward. So I think there are certain tweaks to the system that can definitely improve the scrutiny of government. I mean, there's so many contributions to, to refer to, and I'm just mindful that I'm already eating up five minutes of my time. I'm not sure how much I have remaining. But uh, certainly, for example, the discussion about family life, the balance in family life, the member for Carrick Cumnock and Doon Valley made a very important point about uh, life flexibility, the maternity leave flexibility could be a way of reforming the chamber and how we can improve access uh, particularly looking at proxy voting as well as another alternative. I know certainly these are pressures that have been described by many uh, women members of both parliaments in Westminster and in uh, Anne Hall Road about how that impinges upon their ability to perform their func uh, functions and duties as members. I think the member for Edinburgh Southern, my friend, uh, member for Edinburgh Southern, made, made the point about whilst getting rid of the lectern, sometimes they can be useful, but I, I take the point that they can create a psychological gap and block uh, in, in, in debate, um, but also the importance of iterative debate Breaking the control of business managers, I think, is a point that was brought up by several members as well, um, and allowing the presiding officer's office to determine who is called to speak in debates could certainly improve the quality of debate and the, the role of the member as a parliamentarian first and a party hack second. I think that should be another focus uh, in trying to foster a greater culture of backbench uh, interventions, backbench contributions that aren't necessarily governed by the whips. Happy to give away. Neil Gray, briefly, I, I, I can understand the point he's making about the power of the presiding officer. How, would you reflect on the fact that the Speaker of the House of Commons has the power to take uh, speeches from uh, parliamentary colleagues at Westminster? And I don't think that has particularly changed the element of party hackism at Westminster any more than it is here. <laughs> um, yeah, Paul Sweeney, uh, and if you could be, start winding up, please. No problem. Uh, that's, a, that's a fair point uh, to make, but I think uh, certainly there is something worth testing there and worth checking to see if we can improve the situation. As, of course, this is intended to be an iterative process. It's the beginning of a series of inquiries um, that will no doubt present some really interesting alternatives for how we do our business. So uh, to wind up, though, I have so many other uh, notes that I've taken about other members' contributions, of course, which I unfortunately don't have time to take but, or address. But I think we fundamentally have to look at the question of power in this parliament. This is the role of this parliament to hold the executive to account and there are so many more ways we can improve that capacity and ability to do so but also doing it in a way that is very powerful and including the people in that process and I think that's where the great opportunity of the reforms to create a hybrid parliament has actually shown great promise particularly in committees um, involving more of the people in forming and shaping the debate of the, the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Sweeney. I, I note the comments that various members have made about the interactive um, debate that we've been able to have. Um, I can, though, advise the Chamber we've exhausted all the additional time that we had in hand, so I'll have to be a bit more um, uh, draconian with speeches from here on in, um, and rather trepidatiously, I invite Edward Mountain uh, to wind up. Uh, six minutes, Mr Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, for allowing me to give the wind-up speech, as you called it. Let's see if I can do just that. I welcome today's debate, and I've listened to all of us contribution huge interest. And let's be clear, we have a huge impact on our constituents with the work that we do in the Parliament. And whilst this Parliament may be 22 years of age, I don't believe it's covering that well with age. Presiding Officer, this Parliament presides itself on being a modern Parliament. But what is clear is we are poorly served by our broadcast IT and the protocols that go with that. I remember raising this very issue as convener of the REC Committee in 2017. We held virtual meetings in the bowels of the Parliament because there was only one screen and one room that could do it. And I sometimes wondered if a tin can and a piece of string would have been a better option. Uh, 
The pandemic has forced us to focus our minds on resolving these issues, but progress has been painfully slow. The Parliament saying continually that we have a ro robust system and that we have everything in hand doesn't work for me. Whilst the Parliament can go virtual, as you deliver a virtual speech, as I am now, all you see on the screen is yourself. You can see part of the chamber, you can't see a clock, there's no way of taking interventions. Indeed, presiding officer, I tried in this debate to make an intervention and was refused. And I would like nothing more than to allow interventions on what I'm saying. And all this leads to a very sterile lecture, not a debate. And take my word for it, having been virtual for all of this session since September, not through personal choice, it's been pretty rubbish that I contributed as fully to this parliament as I could have done. And this sterile lecture is now the norm, I fear, for this chamber. Four minute speeches with many members not taking intervention kills debates. And that is why the majority of people in Scotland are not tuning in to watch the parliament. Who can blame them? And when it comes to questions, presiding officer, and I'm not talking about the pats that are raised from the government benches at the back, whoever gets a real answer, Presiding officer, I believe that this should fall totally within the remit of your office to resolve. And I implore this parliament to drive this forward. Questions need answers, not political statements. And let me also remind the parliament that it's not just the Irish parliament that set time limits, so does the Canadian parliament. Think more about this and set time limits on questions and answers. And while this... Uh, Parliament does continue to function during the pandemic. I believe it's a pale imitation of the real thing. And I can say that having not been there since September. I don't think it's good for democracy and accountability to do everything remotely. We need more accountability. We need people in the building and we need to be able to talk to each other, not just across the chamber floor. And we also need strong and effective committees. Having been a convener in the previous session, it is my experience that a committee functions at its best when party politics are left at the door. And I was sorely disappointed on the many occasions when that didn't happen. For example, let me give you a perfect one. When it came to the car parking levy in the transport bill, an SNP member on the REC committee publicly spoke out against the amendment for the months preceding the vote on it. And then the next month, when the vote came along, due to party pressure, he caved in and voted with the government. Whipping in committees might be denied by this government, but in the last seven, uh, session, it was very clear and commonplace. And that is why it is clear to me that the committee system is broken and it needs a complete overhaul, a complete rethink. Until that happens, in my opinion, we will have a government who can do what they want, when they want, and how they want to do it. And to be honest, that's not a good and effective way to make legislation. In fact, it's an embarrassment, I believe, to the people of Scotland and those parliamentarians who try and use the parliament to change things. Now, turning to some of the key points raised in the debate, I think our convener raised many important points, perhaps the most important of which was the need for debate, which by definition is when opposing ideas are discussed and not just put forward without discourse. The amount of intervention proves that he took proves to me that he favours this and he is a man of his word. I'm slightly disappointed that the government's uh, minister, George Adam, didn't identify any of the key failings of the parliamentary procedure, which are clear, clearly evident to other members of the parliament. And I was also taken on a point raised by Stephen Kerr that questions need answers and not just one prepared weeks in advance. And I also take the point of Sarah Boyack on the verbosity of ministers, it was well made. And Jackson Carlo raised some valid points and comments about the need, the reform of FNQs and the format of all questions and answers. I look forward to finding a way around that. And I agreed with Daniel Johnson that this parliament should be about dialogue, which means debate, which means reaching out and talking to each other. And I was taken on the plea by my colleague Tess White for the parliament to be used to make announcements so that Parliament can question it and not just using the media to slip out uh, statements that they want to make. 
Now, presiding officer, I'm conscious my time is running short, but I want to make a point entirely clear, and I've benefited from this. I have benefited from the fact that there is a hybrid parliament and that I can take part from home. I don't propose that we should change that, but I don't think it should be the norm. I think it should be used caringly and sparsely where it is need to allow members to contribute. Because after all, we are better if we are negotiating with each other on a face-to-face -face basis, if that's possible. So I support the hybrid format, but I just don't want it to be the only way we operate. Presiding officer, I believe there's a lot that this parliament needs to do to evolve and to mature after the 22 years that it was originally set up. From the chamber to the committee rooms, we need to see changes which nurture debate and encourage scrutiny. Instead of encouraging lectures, blind loyalty, patsy questions, and no answers being given to opposition or indeed members of the government party. Until we have that, I don't believe the parliament will be working for the benefit of the people of Scotland. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I gave you a little extra time as you had not been able to intervene uh, during the course of the debate. And I call the minister for uh, six minutes, Mr. Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to start with Mr. Mountain. You know, it's, uh, it's good to see that his time at home hasn't stopped his fightiness and be able to put his point of view across. And I think it gives an example of how the system actually has worked for us, where people have been able to use it. And I know Mr. Mountain did say that in his uh, statement. Actually, Mr. Mountain's seen himself on the screen. Surely that's a good thing when he's looking at himself uh, in the screen. I know myself, even someone who is as vain as myself, I found it off-putting as well. So it can be something that we maybe look at as we go on. But one of the things that was brought up uh, during this whole debate has been Maggie Chapman in particular was about culture and how we actually work in this place and how we deal with one another. And Mr Mount and I are a perfect example. We get on well in a one-to-one. -one. We talk, we engage with each other in a one-to-one -one all the time. And I think that's one of the things that we need to, I think I said to Stephen Kerr when we first, he was appointed Chief I says we can fight all we like in the chamber as long as we're out of the chamber we talk to each other like human beings and we get on with the business in hand and I think that's an important part that Maggie Chapman brought up about how we conduct ourselves and how culture is so important to us here. Now this has been an interesting debate, a constructive debate, valuable uh, about the future and how the, we go about the flexibility and how we deal with that uh, flexibility because we have proven already that this has been extremely helpful to every one of us. I have made some suggestions during the past 20 months. Uh, the presiding officers have had no idea. They, they, they didn't think it was a good idea. I suggested putting a countdown clock from the Channel 4 show up there in decision time to make it a wee bit more interesting and have the theme music playing at the same time just to give us that wee extra kind of, we can guarantee you get there. And I do accept uh, that there was times where we've lost members and it's almost ended up with the European Song Contest at decision time where people are phoning in from other areas and saying I didn't, my app didn't work, uh, I managed to do things there and it sometimes can be as long as the European Song Contest but on the whole these have been not the majority of times these have been times, apart from my former colleague and friend Gil Patterson where it seemed to be every single night that Gil couldn't seem to work any technology. But I think this is the argument here. A lot of the time, I do believe, as, and having been in the Bureau for these 20 months, it has not been the technology in the Parliament side. It's been on our side, the technology, either the user's, uh, infer, uh, the user's problem or broadband issues. Yes, Mr Kerr. Stephen Kerr. Once again, he is, not incorrectly, looking at the hybrid arrangements and discussing their merits. I'd be grateful if you could comment on the other suggestion you said, about the procedures of this Parliament that predate any of the changes that were introduced because of the COVID emergency. Minister. Actually coming to that, because I was going to go through some of the bits and pieces that uh, colleagues have already said. Look, Ms Boyack uh, acknowledged that we need to uh, retain what we've already got with this uh, hybrid system and how we move forward. And she did mention the fact that the length of questions and answers, you know, because sometimes the questions can be equally as long. Let's not kid ourselves on. And sometimes, and, and as uh, anybody would do, if someone gives you a long question, you will automatically want to give them value for money and give them a long answer back. And we also have the situation with questions where it can be quite difficult 
for some, because uh, you know, uh, if we give someone a short question, then someone in the opposition benches may say, that was a terribly short question, this is a very important issue, I want you to take this seriously, Minister. So, you know, there's a balance. I admit there's a balance to be found on these issues as well. But for me, I tend to try and keep them as short as possible, because I was trained under the tutelage of the presiding officer that was uh, Tricia Marwick, and she made sure that I cut my questions uh, as short as possible during that period as well. But uh, one of the other things, we do need the flexibility because we are dealing with the COVID situation and it is ongoing. You know, if I use examples, I think Sarah Boyer brought it up as well, was the fact that uh, there was a situation where we, uh, we changed the business. Quite a few members mentioned that at the last minute. And I agree, I try. I try to make sure the business, because I understand everyone's got a life and everyone's got to be elsewhere and other places and they've got their constituencies to deal with as well. I understand that. But there are some times, like if you look at the example of the Deputy First Minister statement in Storm Arwen, uh, that was something that we had to deal with right there on the Tuesday, and it was last minute, I grant that. But on the whole, I tend to try and make sure that we don't have these things at the last minute. And I was, compl I was compl uh, interested in what Maggie Chapman said, I've already mentioned before, about culture and what we want to present and how we want to present this place to the world. And I think that's extremely important because my colleague, Mr Kerr, and I had one of our usual wee barnies earlier on. And that's not necessarily what the public want to see from their legislators when they're doing it. We may enjoy it, but it's not what really people want to see when you talk to members of the public and how we go forward. So I think that was a very interesting point that she made up, uh, she made regarding culture. Elena Whittam also spoke about the practical issues of homeworking, the fact that that can be difficult when you look at the screen and it goes into a buffering zone and you start to worry about that. But these are things that have all got better as time has moved on. And when we look at some of the things that uh, Mr Kerr uh, spoke about, just about everything him and I have spoken about over the past two or three weeks, so I'll, I'll probably have the same discussion with him uh, next week sometime as well, so I'll probably just move on to what someone else has possibly said. Jackson, can I just finish? There's a few members I need to talk about some of the things. Jackson Carlo, actually, uh, and I appreciate a lot what he says, but when he says colleagues came in at the crack of noon, because him and I working in the same industry back in the day, uh, I can understand we all had to work hard, and uh, it wasn't a case of just coming in at the last minute. But I think that's part of the culture as well, is where we need to get to a place that people have to accept that this is a workplace like anywhere else and we move forward, but we still need to be flexible. I see Mr Kerr nodding, agreeing with me, totally there. But we do have to give the flexibility to our members so that they can actually work around their life as well. So on the whole, presiding officer, this has been a very good debate. It's been very interesting. And it's also one that we need to have something more like this in a more, more often. When we look at uh, any form of reform for the government, I just want to say, closing, if we look at reform, we can't do it in piecemeal. We have to make sure... Well, no, the you. minister's just winding up, We can't do it in piecemeal. We have to look at the reform in its entirety. And I hope the committee and the parliament can look at this as a way forward, and this debate is the way forward for us. Thank you, Minister, and apologies to members for cutting across them, but we are out of time. As I said, I now call on Bob Doris to wind up uh, the debate on behalf of the Standards and Public Appointments Committee for around seven minutes, Mr Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start off, as others, on actually by thanking parliamentary staff who are the glue that have kept this parliament going in the most difficult of times, from the cleaners to the catering staff, the kitchen staff, and to the IT staff who have had massive challenges. And an absolute thank you to every single one of them. And can I thank every single speaker in this debate? I've got a variety of views. I'm quite keen to express in some of the comments, but I'm speaking on behalf of the committee, of course, so be reflective rather than pejorative in some of the, 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 the comments that I've heard uh, here the, 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 this, uh, this afternoon. But thank you to each and every speaker. And a particular thank you to the convener, who I think set off with a, an excellent tone, which mostly, I think, members followed mostly through the debate, although at times... When the convener mentioned uh, 1970s wrestling, I did think with Mr Kerr and Mr Adam, it felt a bit more like Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks <laughs> rather than a parliamentary exchange, I have to say. Uh, but, but the reason we're here this afternoon, of course, is because Parliament has reformed through necessity. But what we have to do is reflect on that and we have to innovate. And I think that's what we're here together 
as a parliament trying to tease out from our committee uh, this afternoon our starting point. We have to embed progress that there's been. We have to be very open and honest where that progress has not been what we would have liked it to have been. We have to rectify, identify and rectify shortcomings and innovate differently, perhaps something completely different from has been tried already. And of course, there are issues in Parliament before COVID and before 2007 as well. But when we look through the lens of this debate, let's try and do it in a non-tribal way and come together as a Parliament. So let's shape, let's mould, let's nurture, let's develop and let's co-produce what the, Scot the Scottish Parliament of the future looks like. Well, I spent some time talking about a hybrid Parliament. I think by and large there was almost a uh, unanimity that we should stick with the hybrid parliament, we should reform how it works perhaps, but we should stick with it. Julie Mackay mentioned how those with disabilities can benefit and it can promote diversity, as did CoCab Stewart. Um, I think the Minister mentioned those who think coming to Edinburgh routinely may be a barrier to standing for election. It can encourage more people to stand for election, quite frankly. Uh, and Sarah Boyack was uh, very clear about how the hybrid parliament allows for the flexible management of casework for busy MSPs and constituency offices and Jackson Carlow uh, made a, a, a very similar point. Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time in relation to the aspect of family life that um, Daniel Johnson and, and Neil Gray and others mentioned. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I became a dad shortly after the election for the second time and can I just say, uh, be careful how I phrase this, but I have found it a huge challenge to balance my parliamentary duties both here in the Chamber and Parliament, my constituency duties and be a good dad and husband at the same time. And something's got to give. And quite often what gives is my wife does more than she should ever have to do, quite frankly. And we have to think about the balance of family life for men and women, whether they're in this place or our partners back at home. We have to think about that quite bluntly. <laughs> Yes. Finlay Carson. Uh, thank you very much. I absolutely share exactly what you've said there, being in, in the same position. But one of the main factors is the uncertainty, because you can generally plan. You know, we can't have everything our own way. It's never going to be, if you like, a normal life as being an elected uh, a politician. But the difficulty with the Parliament and the way it is just at the moment is the uncertainty about when we can get home, uh, when we're expected to be in the chamber. And that really needs to be tackled as a as a, a matter of urgency. Bob Doris. Uh, Finlay Carson, so let me go into the idea of decision time, which was something I was going to go into, but I'll just deal with it just now. Uh, yes, it, it gets pushed back later and later, many an evening, and then it, can cha it changes at very short notice. It's not possible to plan around that, and it's simply not acceptable. I thought uh, Jackson Carlow had an interesting point about a set time at the start of business the following day. Could there be forward? We absolutely have to look at it. But just finally, in relation to hybrid working, it is fair to point out that we have to make sure there is a dynamic that is not lost with hybrid working, and interventions absolutely has to be part of that as well. And I just want to put that on the record. There was a wide ranging debate in relation to scrutiny of government, uh, in relation to pre prepared questions and supplementaries from both government backbenchers, from opposition members, and from ministers themselves. Uh, about the balance of opposition time, about members' debates, about committee debates, about the use of topical and emergency questions, uh, and the idea of scripted speeches. And I think there was an acknowledgement, um, I think, from Graham Simpson, actually, that those scripted speeches quite often come not just from government, but from opposition as well, where there's a carved-out position in the advance of a debate. And I think that's a political reality in this place. Uh, I won't say much more on committees because of time, but I wish folk had spoke more about committees because that is the lifeblood of this parliament in terms of scrutiny. The major scrutiny will not happen in this place. These are the set-piece debates. The committees are the absolute lifeblood of scrutiny. Uh, Eleanor Whitman spoke about uh, a job share example with Councillor Kelly Parry uh, in, in Cosla, which I thought is something we have to start thinking about if we're realistic about work-life balance and being an inclusive parliament. I put that on the, the, the record as well. And remote voting as well. I think Ella Whitman and others mentioned that uh, in relation to an elderly relative, for example, and care and responsibilities some people might have. And Neil Gray mentioned how Amy Callaghan had been frozen out of voting at Westminster. I, I'm not allowed to make a comment on that because I'm speaking on behalf of the committee, but I just wanted to mirror that back in this chamber. So, uh, presiding officer, there, we do need to reform. We do have to bring Parliament together, 
in doing that, and we have to get a balance. Hybrid proceedings must not and will not replace human face-to-face -face contact. It must complement it, and it must support it. We must seize the opportunities of hybrid working, but we must also address the pitfalls. Um, relationships are also the lifeblood of this parliament, even where we disagree with each other. And those relationships are often fostered not online or virtual, but face-to-face, -face, before committee, after committee, in the canteen, at parliamentary receptions. And those relationships have still to be forced by many people in this place because they've simply not had the chance to do it. And that really has to happen. And that's important to put on the record as well. So in the very limited time that I have left, presiding, presiding officer, let's shape parliamentary reform, not based on any individual's self-interest or any party's self-interest or whether we're in government or in opposition. But let's get the tone right as we shape Scotland's parliament going forward. Let's get the relationship right between government and opposition and legislature. Let's get the scrutiny right. Let's make sure parliament remains accessible, transparent and fit for purpose. Let's also remember there's many good things existing in this parliament right now. Let's not just dismiss that either. But let's shape Scotland's parliament going forward in the best interests of all the people of Scotland, non-tribal, non-partisan, open-minded, bold, innovative, inclusive. That's no small challenge for our committee, Mr Convener, but it's one I know we're up for, and it's one I'm absolutely convinced Parliament is also up for. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on shaping parliamentary procedures and practices for the future. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 2563 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. No member has asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 2563 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 2565 and 2566 on approval of SSIs. Thank you very much, President Officer, and moved again. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. I call Patrick Harvey for a point of order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to raise a point of order regarding exchanges at the end of yesterday's debate on backing the North East economy. Now, it is undeniable that feelings were running high in that debate, uh, and I was, of course, frustrated when Douglas Lumsden misquoted my comments about party political support for development of new fossil fuel extraction. And I acknowledge that I do not know whether he had, in fact, ever bothered to check what I had actually said, or if he merely accepted on face value a false media report and repeated it without knowing. However, I do, of course, accept that matters of accuracy are not something that you are able to rule on. You and previous presiding officers have frequently been annoyed by accuracy matters being raised in this way. So I could and should have found a different way to challenge the inaccuracy and to ask Mr Lumsden to correct the record. However, it is very clear that what followed was far more serious than a slightly annoying use of a point of order. In relation to a physical attack which took place against his local office, and speaking in direct reference to me, Mr Lumsden stated, I am not telling the police how to do their job, but perhaps they should consider that a member of this parliament instigated that attack. Presiding officer, in both his words and his body language, he made it perfectly clear that I was the member he was referring to. Let me be equally clear. This allegation 
of instigating an attack on his office is utterly baseless and deeply offensive. I consider it to be clearly defamatory, and if it had been made anywhere else but in the Chamber of Parliament, I would be taking legal advice. However, conduct in the Chamber is regulated by the Code of Conduct and by your own role as presiding officer. We surely cannot permit a situation in which a member is able to level a completely spurious allegation of serious criminal conduct against another member without consequences. To do so would signal to all members that such disgraceful behaviour is acceptable. So can I ask you, presiding officer, what are the consequences for Mr Lumsden's shocking abuse of his position in Parliament, and how can all members be assured that they will be protected from such behaviour in the future? I thank you for the advance notice of the point of order, Mr Harvey. Having reviewed the footage of the exchanges, I spoke privately this morning to Mr Lumsden and then to yourself, Mr Harvey. Uh, feelings were indeed running high yesterday afternoon, and some of the remarks made in the Chamber fell short of the standard of conduct required of members of this Parliament. As part of my discussion this morning, as you know, I asked Mr Lumsden, Mr. Lumsden to reflect on his language, and I do not expect any repetition, but I consider the matter closed. Thank you. There are seven questions to be put as a result of yesterday's business and today's business. The first is that Amendment 2552.3, in the name of Michael Matheson, which seeks to amend Motion 2552, in the name of Liam Kerr, on backing the North East economy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote, and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.